All right, everybody, let's get down to the, uh, the business end of things. Afternoon, I'm David Kosh um, and work for Seven and have my own family business. It's great to have you here and I have the pleasure of introducing James Warburton and then to moderate the, uh, the panel following his address. A uh, bit of background on James. He uh, uh, is a seasoned media professional, uh, began his career in advertising, working at Universal McCann, uh, then moved into the media Worked for the Seven Network, then Ten, then APN Outdoor, and then he followed his real love of being a rev head and going to be chief executive of Supercars for five years. Then he saw the light, he got off the fumes, uh, and he came back to Seven. Of course, Seven Network also owns the West Australian newspapers and online services, including Seven Plus and uh, SevenNews.com.au. Um, I reckon I've known. James for 15 years or so, and over that time, I've learned that, um, like me, he is a true believer in television and the power of television. It's great to see industry leaders getting out and talking about why the industry is so good and why it will continue to succeed in the era of streamers competing for viewers and digital platforms competition for, for advertisers. And uh, there are plenty of doomsayers out there, but uh, uh, there have been, I think, for about 15 years and continue to be proved wrong. So James is going to spend the next 25 minutes or so reminding us of why free-to-air TV in Australia is such a great service and where it is heading, most importantly, into the future, because it's disrupting itself as well. Uh, he's also... Um, going to reveal some very exciting news that shows, and I welcome my um, colleagues from home and away here to uh, uh, probably their first seat of lunch, um, <laughs> uh, but also uh, the revelation that uh, as a group, they're amongst Australia's most important exporters. Um, Ray Ma asked whether he could apply a and be an export grant into the future, I said you would have to get better advice than that. But it's a fascinating study on why free to, the economic benefit of one particular show in free-to-air TV over years and years has made an enormous difference. It's not just a one-movie sugar hit or an eight-part streaming sugar hit. Uh, this is a show that's been around for years and years, day in, day out, employing people and earning export dollars. Uh, after James has spoken, we'll be joined by uh, CETA Chief Executive, uh, Melanie, uh, the author of the Home and Away research, and uh, I think home and a, a closet Home and Away fan, Jerome Frere, and Bridget Fair, for the Chief Executive of Free, to Air, of Free TV. But before the panel, and we'll take your questions, you can submit the questions on the CETA app, um, which is terrific. I, I was told that each question gets voted on by the rest of the audience, so no pressure to make your, your question really good, um, and then I will put it to the panel. Uh, before that, though, would you please welcome James Warbiter. Well, thank you, Koshi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you to Melinda uh, from CETA uh, for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge our First Nations people as the traditional owners and sovereign custodians of the lands on which we work and live, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I've worked in television for 34 years now, which actually means I'm unfortunately getting old. First in media agencies, and then as Koshi said, as MD and CEO of two of our three free-to-air networks. I absolutely love television. As an industry, it's an absolute buzz. It moves at a rapid pace. It gets a scorecard in the terms of audience measurement every single day, even Christmas Day. And what it does, what it creates, truly and deeply matters to many Australians. It drives conversations and sets the agenda. Sunrise's wonderful Natalie Barr said to me recently, James, I've been reading the news for 14 years, and when I go to sleep at night, I have absolutely no idea what I'll be doing or talking about tomorrow at 5.30 a.m. when you wake up. And that embodies what we're all about. Every single day, we bring Australians the best news on a live and local basis. 
unforgettable sporting moments, great Australian entertainment and information content. It's an escape from the everyday for many people and the honour of being an invited guest into people's homes and even more so now onto their own personal devices is something that's never ever been lost on me. And I love how television is evolving. For as long as I've worked in it, the naysayers have claimed that we're a dying industry, as Koshi said in the beginning. Seven is viewed as a legacy media with a multiple valuation to match what people see as a declining industry. Now, of course, you'd expect me to disagree, but time and time again, the facts prove this wrong. It's something that really frustrates me, but it's our fault. We haven't told our story clearly enough or strongly enough. There's no doubt we're changing and doing so at pace. And in changing, we are building an incredibly sophisticated offer that cannot be replicated in size and in scale. TV as you know it, the thing hanging on the wall with a remote control to change channels, is not television at all. That set on the wall is just part, albeit at a very important one, of a video ecosystem we call total television. And that total television market is much bigger than you think. It's growing, it's digital, it's mobile, and we're tapping into those growth markets at a staggering rate. Take the state of the streaming market, globally and locally, and the assumption until recently was that the streamers would just roll over the top of the legacy business, the old legacy media businesses, but with a $100 billion global investment in content, none of the streamers are making any profit. And I think it's a great case study for legacy media. The legacy studios have simply taken back their content, removing it from the aggregators like Netflix, developed their own streaming services direct-to-consumer, and suddenly the world for the streamers isn't looking so easy. Netflix said, don't worry, we'll pivot to lower cost advertising, but actually it's not going to be quite that simple. Here in Australia and around the world, the streamers' owned content is something they can do anything with but content is sold in either AVOD or SVOD rights. So even here in Australia, you can get things free on 7 Plus or you can pay for Netflix. So it's going to take them years to get that done. In Australia, we have a number of shared titles, as I said, but 7 has the AVOD contract. So that's something that we can move very quickly through. In Australia, there are more than 20, million, 20 streaming services excluding free-to-air television BVOD services, and the top five hold over 85% of the market. So consolidation and economic responsibility will start to play out in the streaming industry as we move forward. Here in Australia, television makes an enormous economic contribution. According to research by Deloitte, the total contribution to the commercial television industry in 2019 was $2.3 billion. We supported more than 16,000 full-time equivalent positions directly and indirectly, and it's estimated that 230,000 international tourists visited or extended their stay as a result of viewing Australian television and film content, which generated $725 million in tourism expenditure a year. Sport is a real way of life for us as Australians and for our kids, and media rights are the absolute lifeblood of sport with an estimated $1.5 billion every year in rights payments underpinning sport. So we underpin these national competitions and we allow them to grow and to come to the grassroots and reach the whole of Australia for free. Looking forward, it's clear to see that when free-to-air television invests in content, we absolutely draw in audiences and eyeballs. When you consider this chart and look at the left, we are not in decline, we are actually growing our audiences. No matter the demographic and how it's viewed, total television, the red bar, in all of its forms, is the most dominant of any medium. Screen time is growing and our content is connecting. The right of the chart shows our digital BVOD services, which is actually the AVOD market, and it's booming and growing at an absolute staggering rate. 76% of our BVOD audience is aged under 50. They choose to watch television like a streaming service, on their mobile, on their laptop, or on a connected tel television, however and whenever suits them. These are massive numbers. To put 7 Plus in perspective, we now have 12.5 million verified registered users. 
And that's an incredibly powerful marketing platform. When big data is overlaid, in our case, 6 billion data points, marketers have a powerful addressium medium which delivers quality video, and it's done so in a brand-safe environment. And that's why we make different decisions on content, and it's not just about broadcast. We now invest in digital to engage viewers on the platforms where they are watching our content. More importantly, when we measure television correctly, we are growing. It is without doubt the quickest and most effective reach builder for advertisers. For 22 years, the industry has owned and published OzTam Ratings Daily Data. It's been robust and it's been world's best practice. But for 22 years, we've shown our decline year after year after year. So despite the changes to viewing and the inclusion of digital, as an industry, we've been complacent and continue to do the same thing. At Seven, we've been leading the charge on changing the way our audiences are measured and reported. The industry's new measurement platform called Virtual Oz or Voz will report true viewing numbers for our content from the start of calendar year 2023. So when total television is measured correctly, you can see that on an overnight basis, we reach 14 million people. That grows 21% four days later and another 29% in 28 days. So given we trade, negotiate, post-analyse on campaigns on a 28-day basis, that's a 57% increase from overnight audience numbers. So the challenge I put to my peers in TV is simple. Let's get rid of the overnights, even just for a month, and let's start telling the real story. And that's exactly what happens in the UK and the US, where they focus on three days and seven days in terms of ratings. We hear all the time that everyone is streaming with the inference that no one is watching television. These two charts show all video in the home and on every device. And on the left, you can see that 77% of all viewing across the week is on a total television platform or free TV platform. And the graph on the right shows that if actually you would like to reach them and advertise to them, 90% of the available opportunities today are with free-to-air television. So it's pretty staggering when you think about that. Screen time is booming. There's different viewing habits. But when people sit and watch video content, free-to-air television still has 90% of the opportunities to reach those people. So there's plenty of life left yet in, the, in legacy media. We're truly swimming in a new lane and pivoting to digital growth markets. Four years ago, digital accounted for just 2% of Seven's earnings. For FY22, we've guided to the market that that will be greater than 40%. According to the latest PwC Entertainment Outlook report, the BVOD advertising market will grow from $300 million in 2021 to $900 million by calendar 2025. With Seven Plus and quality addressable data and driven campaigns, we are now coming for our share of the $2.5 billion AVOD market, which has been dominated by YouTube. This chart indicates the potential for Seven to move from competing in a television-only market, worth $3.8 billion, to competing in a total TV market, worth $6.6 .6 billion, and a market that's growing and growing at a staggering pace. Our future continues to be our absolute obsession with quality content that Australians want to watch. And if we do that successfully, we will continue to thrive. Good Australian content has far-reaching impact beyond the number of people who watch it each and every day. It enriches the social fabric of Australia, it informs voters, it holds the powerful to account, and it tells stories, provides employment, and it promotes Australian tourism. Every year, Australia's commercial free-to-air networks spend $1.5 billion producing local content and telling Australian stories. That translates into about 23,000 hours of Australian content broadcast on commercial television each and every year. Of all the money commercial television networks spend on content each year, about 85% of it is spent on Australian content. Australians want, expect and deserve to be able to watch sport on TV for free, whether it's the AFL, the NRL, the cricket, the Olympics or the Melbourne Cup. They don't want the sports they know and have and love 
locked behind paywalls. The love of sport and access to sport for free on TV is a core part of our life. Everyone can watch it. It creates heroes. It inspires the kids to get away from the gaming consoles. It unites the nation. Australians also want to see Australian stories in drama, entertainment, reality and lifestyle shows which reflect them. They want to see themselves in society, reflected in that content, not just a version that is tailored to be palatable from a global provider. And that is why the free-to-air networks content is constantly evolving to be more diverse and inclusive and why our content and services continue to appeal to Australian audiences. Television is everywhere, yet its very ubiquity means that its reach and impact can sometimes be overlooked and the very real contribution it makes to our economy and way of life can often be taken for granted. To demonstrate this, we commissioned ACEL Allen to measure the impact Home and Away has had on the Australian economy, cultural landscape and tourism over the past 34 years. And I'd like to acknowledge our supercar cast and crew who are with us today from the show, or many are with us from the show, who are among the hardest working team you will find anywhere in Australian television. The results of the research being released today are pretty remarkable and they really quantify and highlight Home and Away's real impact on economic activity in the Australian production sector, tourism and its significant contribution to our society. They underscore Free to Air's important role in shaping our national identity. From 1988 to 2021, Home and Away has been sold to 145 countries around the world. It generated export revenue of more than a billion dollars. It increased the real income of Australia by seven and a half billion dollars. It created almost 13,000 employee years and it directly contributed, and indirectly, contributed to Australia's international reputation, generating benefits through domestic and international tourism. Let's take a look. I agree with Ray, best, best place on the earth. In addition to the impressive numbers you just saw, the results of the research conducted in the UK, Ireland and New Zealand also reveal Home and Away's impact on the desirability to visit Australia. And that impact is significant. Among current or lapsed viewers in those markets, 33% said Home and Away increased their desire to visit Australia. So put it another way, it's a fantastic big ad for Australia and a bloody good plug for television as an effective marketing platform. 
We don't simply make Home and Away because we have to. We make it because Australians love Australian content. But the regulatory framework needs to evolve to continue to promote the unique aspects of our industry. Good television regulation is about keeping it free, local, trusted, competitive and found. Free means promoting a healthy and competitive advertising market where the digital giants don't control the entire value chain so that we can continue to fund the important content we make. Free means keeping sport on free TV by ensuring Australians have access to the events like the Olympics or their local AFL derby without having to pay for it. And this is achieved through the anti-siphoning list, which ensures the most popular events are on free-to-air televisions and not on pay television. But there's a loophole in the current list. And currently there is nothing preventing the codes from selling directly to streaming companies with the entire sport disappearing behind a paywall. So closing this loophole should be an important priority for the new government, and we're pleased that the Prime Minister and Minister Rowland have both committed to keeping sport free and a review of the anti-siphoning list as a policy of this new government. Local, our second factor means local stories told through a local lens. At seven, we're required to run 55% Australian content between 6 a.m. and midnight. We don't just accept this condition as part of our licence requirement, we celebrate it. In fact, it's what makes us unique. But we don't need artificial competition introduced into content creation. And that's why I'm calling on our government to not introduce SFOD quotas, as it will simply drive up prices. Next, we need to talk about trust. How and where people see our content is key to the type of society we live in. We have an open and free democracy where all views are and should be explored. However, with the rise of the digital giants, we now have gatekeepers writing the rules that govern what we see on their ubiquitous platforms. Our open and free democracy is something to be proud of, and the role of a fearless and accurate media free from misinformation is key to this. That's not to say we don't get it wrong sometimes, but when we do, we are held to account. Meta's ability to control the algorithms that determine what we see, when we see it, and where was clearly demonstrated by the removal of all news and additional government sites from their service last year. Given we know what they're capable of, it's hard to buy the argument that it's too hard to eliminate unapproved fake ads of Koshi spruiking financial products. When motivated to control what we see, they easily find a way. So when we talk about why we'll continue to be relevant, a lot of it is centred around trust. Competition is also an important part of the media sector. It ensures diversity of opinion, provides options for advertisers and ensures a large variety of entertainment op options for Australian viewers. But the economy-wide impact of the digital platforms on competition cannot be underestimated. In the digital platforms inquiry, the ACCC uncovered that digital platforms have substantial market power. A bargaining imbalance is present and that they are unavoidable partners for so many. But what we have seen in the media sector is really just the canary in the coal mine. Digital platforms are now deep in the business model of so many Australian businesses and are essential to running a business in a modern economy. The global digital businesses have enormous power. Their tentacles are far-reaching and cover sectors like finance, travel and retail, just to name a few. So that's why the ACCC's March discussion paper for updating the competition and consumer law for digital platform services is such an important document, not only for media, but for the broader economy. In fact, I would say it's as important to us as the news media bargaining code. The digital platform services inquiry, due to be completed in 2025, is broader than just our sector. It looks at the intensity of competition in markets for supply of digital platform services, including electronic marketplaces. So we call on the government to maintain the focus and the important work that the ACCC is doing. But all of that important work by the government and the ACCC is fruitless if Australians can't find us. And that's why the immediate priority for Minister Rowland is to regulate prominence of free-to-air television services. We were delighted that prior to the election, the Labor Party committed to regulating prominence. 
Now they are in government, this is set to become reality and we hope that this can be put into legislation by the end of 2022. It's now urgent. According to Think TV research, connected TVs or internet-based TVs now account for 56% of all television sets in Australia and that figure is growing and growing rapidly. Connected TVs provide viewers with more choice, but with this choice comes again the rise of gatekeepers who choose who gets to be seen first and who is easily found, positions which often go to the highest bidders. There is no denying that finding content on connected sets is getting harder and harder, and the big multinational content companies are paying to get the best spots on the TV and on the remote. Operating system providers are deciding how that content is ordered and then how it is actually served to viewers. So the free-to-air television business model requires us to be advertising funded, which relies on us being freely available to all Australians. The regulatory framework must be updated to ensure the prominence of commercial broadcast services. And other countries like the UK have already recognised the threat to their free-to-air broadcasters and have announced plans to legislate to address the problem. By ensuring we remain prominent, we can continue to invest our resources into producing news and Australian content more broadly, not staving off invisibility and bidding against the cash-rich conglomerates that want to divert viewers away from Australian news, sport, drama and entertainment services. When advertisers want to build brands or promote their products, their number one choice is commercial free-to-air television. When a sports fan wants to catch their team's blockbuster game, their predominant choice is commercial television. When a sports organisation wants to reach their audience, they turn to commercial free-to-air television. That dominance of both audience and advertisers is what keeps commercial television relevant and profitable. Careful management of that profit profitability enables us to invest in Australian stories. And that closes the loop, engaging audiences and advertisers. And in the process, we create enormous value for the Australian economy reflecting our culture and telling our stories. I'm incredibly optimistic and excited about the future of television. Thank you. And let's welcome up our panel, Jerome, Melinda, and also Bridget. And and don't forget, if you want to put a question to the panel, do it through the Cedar app and it comes straight through to me. Jerome, why don't you go there? And while the panel comes up, James, why did you, why did you commission uh, the report by Jerome and Asil Allens? It, it's one show um, on a 24-7 television network, so it's only a tiny bit of it, but the numbers are massive. Yeah, I think they're staggering, and it you know, comes back to that point, uh, Koshi, that sometimes you know, we've been around for a long time, home and away itself has been around for 34 years, and it's often overlooked in the conversation. You know, this is not, as you said in your intro, an eight-part series you know, or, a, or a movie, and I'm not, again, I'm not having a go at um, you know, that contribution to the economy, but this is what we do across an entire range, whether it's our news services, you know, our sports contribution, um, and it is an absolute staggering number. So I think it comes back to shining a light on the contribution that free-to-air television makes in the economy. But just as a snapshot, how many people does Seven employ? Because it's not just home and away. It's that, that jobs day in, day out, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, I think when you look at the overall footprint, you know, we're just under the sort of the 2,000 uh, level, um, you know, in terms of employment. But as we scale, you know, every time we're producing an AFL match or, you know, producing shows, we have a lot of our production companies uh, here today when we, you know, go and um, commission Big Brother or Million Dollar Island or any of the shows that we do, you know, we employ enormous crews, um, you know, ac across the board. And so it comes back to that overall, you know, sort of benchmark um, on the Deloitte report in 2019. But... It is a huge industry, and it ha and it has, you know, massive levels of reach uh, across the Australian market. Must telling have been, our stories. You know, when I found out I was doing this, I, 
I sort of checked how many people does Netflix uh, employ here in Australia. I didn't realise its parent company was Dutch based. Um, but it worked out my little family business employs more people and I reckon I pay more tax than them here in Australia. <laughs> I'm thinking, how can that happen? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, Melinda, also, it shines light, the Home and Away report, on just how important the creative industries are to the Australian economy, does it? On, and the ripple effect through so many other industries. Yeah, look, um, I was pleased that we could, we could help you sort of promote um, these issues and, and the report. Um, one, because I'm an economist, so I'm an economics nerd, so I love an economics report. But what it does is it shows the importance of, of one show, but also the industry more broadly. Um, and the reach is, is phenomenal in terms of, as you said, um, jobs, um, opportunities created for people. And if you look at the, I mean, look at the cover of the report, we saw the video. I mean, if that's not promotion for Australia and people wanting to come and see what an amazing place this is, and I suspect the report actually underestimates what that flow and effect is because it's really hard to pin that down. So you, you underestimate rather than put a, a really big number out there. So it's, it's really significant. And the final point I think is that you're sort of touching on Everyone, there's a lot of focus on what we do well and the mining and resources and all the rest of it. Really important. There's a lot of talk about technology and STEM. But the thing that's often missing from that is the important role that creativity plays in that. Um, and the intersection of creativity um, and the enablement of technology to actually allow new things to be done that we never thought we could. And we're seeing in Australia that we can do that. And we need to shine more of a light on that. And the importance of things that you might look at and think, well, where does that sit? But you read about it, we all know the stories. Australians who've started here and gone off, they're making connections, they're creating an image of what is, the, what is possible. So it's, I just think it's a great story. And, and we're really good at it in this country. Um, uh, Sam Mack on Sunrise's Weather Today was um, going through Vivid and one of the displays was designed by Animal Logic. Well, here's a business that is world class, has won Oscars, and is a massive employer, isn't it? Mm. And develop technology that is global standard. Look, and if you look at a, at a story like Tasmania, Tasmania was really struggling for a long time, and it's recreated um, energy and dynamism in its economy and in its broader community on the basis of creative industries um, and opportunities. So it's, it's really important that we don't lose sight of that. And that, that extends all the way across the spectrum, including the sort of content that, that's been created through a, a program like Home and Away. Jerome, you did the study. Were you surprised at the impact this just one single show had on the economy? Jerome, we've got a, a problem. Life problem. I was going to get closer, but in COVID <laughs> times, I thought that would be inappropriate. But yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that's very wise. Um, as I was saying, um, yeah. the, the tourism impact uh, we couldn't quantify, it, but we do know generally the tourists, when they when they come to Australia, spend a lot of money because it, it's a long way and, and it costs a lot to get to come here, so they. They stay for quite some time, and home and away um, attracts tourists to Australia a, lo a lot of them, and that, that's on top of the numbers that we found uh, yep. that we could estimate. So it, it, it's a very big deal, and it's just one TV show. Yeah. <laughs> well, I live on the northern beaches, and I know there are plenty of flaming home and away fans that take the reservations at our local <laughs> restaurants as they come <laughs> up to try out Summer Bay. That's for sure. Um, um, but also, it's the career development of Australians going overseas as well. And you spoke to a, a lot of ex home It's not just Chris Hemsworth uh, <laughs> who tre treads the global stage. No, it's not. And we, we did speak to, to a number of people, and um, they, they all told the same story, which is what a great training ground it was for them, because generally they, it was their, one of their first jobs in the industry, and they were trained rigorously and well, and and not just in the in the 
craft that they started with. They moved on to become directors and producers and, and did other things. And, and many of them have gone on to great careers o overseas. And what, what they've said was that Home and Away on their CV uh, opens doors. Even in the US where Home and Away hasn't been shown, I think. They know it, they know it there. They know how well people are, are, are trained and, and, and how good they are. And, and it's, it's a real career developer for people in the industry. Yep. Uh, Bridget, you've worked for a number of the networks. Now you, you represent the industry all up. Um, <coughs> it is pretty annoying, the number of people that go, oh, free-to-air TV is a dinosaur, it's, it's going out of favour, it's not disrupting itself. So I think what James's address showed and Jerome's report is that it has been disrupting itself we just haven't been measuring it properly. We're almost our, our own worst enemy, aren't we? Well, yes. Um, we, we really do need to do a better job at telling that story about how wide our reach really is. Um, and it really comes down to the kind of community that we want to live in. I mean, that's why TV is so important, because it's a shared experience. That's the experience that we are all having. And it doesn't matter whether you live in metropolitan Sydney or out in the boondocks doesn't matter whether you're the CEO of Channel 7 or the person packing the shelves in Coles, you all have access to a free service and you can all share in those moments and it makes us a community and it matters. Yep. But we all are. But it's not, are. not, not being shown. Like I, I'm an old newspaper bloke and I remember when there was circulation, uh, audited circulation figures and print runs. None of that's there anymore. It is for newspapers. This is our digital footprint, print, the whole lot, and some number magically appears. Uh, we don't tend to do that in free-to-air at the moment. Well, that's what's exciting about Voz coming next year because we'll be able to tell that story so much better where we can show the total reach of television, not just what people watched last night but what they watch across three days, seven days, 28 days, and not just watch they watch on, what they watch on the screen on the wall but what they watch on the bus what they watch, you know, up in bed on their tablet or all of those things are all going to be captured so much better and people will understand what we all know because if you talk to people at a dinner party or whatever, everybody knows these shows They or they've watched the news or they see the sport or whatever. Um, so we know anecdotally that people are watching out there and we have to tell that story better. Yeah. It is funny when you go to a dinner party and people go, oh, I don't watch commercial TV, and then as they get a few wines into them, you know, you know, I sat down and watched Home and Away with my teenage daughter or something like that all the time. It is uh, ridiculous. Is regulation keeping up with the changing dynamics of, of TV? Well, regulation never keeps up with changing dynamics, and that's probably a good thing because we don't want regulation to be ahead of the industry, but it needs to maybe catch up a little bit faster. We've seen some really great regulation happen in the last few years. We've had the News Media Bargaining Code, which really was a great way of recognising the anti-competitive power of big tech uh, and put in place a framework that allowed local media companies to actually have real commercial negotiations with those platforms. And that's an example of a very forward-thinking piece of regulation that doesn't just try to impose a one-size-fits-all outcome, but actually allows people to do the commercial deals that suits, but those deals were not possible because of the bargaining imbalance prior to the code. So we do need more regulation. James has mentioned a very important area, which is prominence, because if we don't know how to find our local media services, then they won't be able to exist and we won't have all the things that we've just talked about, about shared experiences. So, so to almost compare it, it's like everyone's complaining Facebook changes the algorithm all the time and it's hard to, to access an audience. For TV, it's who owns the, or manufactures the set determines the priority, does it? Yeah, I mean, look, the, even 10 smart, years ago, if you went home with a TV set from the shop, put it up on the wall, up would pop all your channels and off you go to the races. Great, watch whatever you like. Now, you're basically hanging a big computer on your wall and whoever controls that operating system inside that computer controls the experience that you will have and the content that you can find. Um, James, just run us through the figures on how Australians love Australian content. 
I mean, it's you know, it's predominantly what drives you know television. So it's often not sexy to talk about, but one of the shows, two of the shows possibly in terms of two of the networks that are top one or two most nights is still the local news services. And these are not news services, you know, it's not like we do a national news out of Sydney. We're doing a Sydney about a Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, East Coast, Gold Coast, you know, New England, you know, you name it, all the way across the country. And so in our case, we're doing 52 regional bulletins and we're doing about nine, you know, including, including spill regions. So that's an enormous commitment um, every single day. That's actually the number one show on television. Sport is up there as well, you know, in, ter you know, in terms of the relativities. And then we're, we're really doing a lot of, you know, what we call, you know, stripped reality or, you know, sort of tentpole style programs as well, whether it's Big Brother or The Voice, um, you know, in, in our case. And so these are not just about those overnight numbers, they're about the streaming minutes as well. You know, so you look at something like Big Brother, and it has an overnight number and it gets judged in the trade media. And, you know, this is our fault because we put these daily numbers out and in a week's time, you know, that is another 60, 70% audience on top of that overnight number. Yep. You know, Home and Away is about the number three um, program every night in stream. So, you know, again, there's an enormous amount of people that go home on the bus and, you know, they, they actually, um, you know, watch Home and Away on the way home on the bus and they don't have to watch it at 7 o'clock or 7.01. They can watch it whenever they want, whether they, you know, watch last night's, watch, you know, watch something at 7.30. So... It's a very different world we live in and we need to lean forward into that. We've almost got agreement you know, from all the networks to go forward. There's one, um, you know, which we're waiting on to actually make the steps and make the changes, um, you know, that I spoke about today. And I won't say which one it is because that would probably be counterproductive. Oh, come on. It's not us. <laughs> it's not us in case you... Uh, power, power of sport of course, is, yep. is huge. It's real-life drama um, every second that you're watching. How important is that to keep access free? We just saw Optus Sport sort of ratchet up its pricing. Uh, was it 60% or something its pricing went up? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, again, you know, the legislation, uh, 1982, I think, Bridget, from memory, isn't it? 92. No, 92. 92. Um, was geared around pay TV. And now we have, you know, sort of all these streaming companies. And so you have to think about a number of things. You don't just think about what the service is and what you might have to pay for it $6, $8, $12, $15. You actually have a broadband plan and you have a cap and you obviously have all your data as well. So by the time you piece it together, it is getting to be a very expensive, you know, sort of experience uh, for Australian consumers. But let's not forget that we've got communities, so it's lovely when we sit in you know, an urban city like Sydney where the internet's pretty good, but when you think of some of the remote regional areas, I mean, people are chewing through data in four days and five days mm. as communities where you know, the internet is not as reliable as the vast network where we you know, send out our signal, uh, and it is available you know, for free. So, it's, it's an interesting area, and as, as I said in the speech, you know, we've had you know, fantastic commitment from the Labor government, uh, Minister Rowland, you know, who has an um, outstanding um, perspective uh, on our industry, and we're seeing it in the UK. So we feel that with prominence and the anti-siphoning list being updated to actually take in streaming services, free to wear will have a very, very uh, you know, exciting future. We won't see these things disappear. Can I just jump in? Because also there's a very um, interesting case study about what happens when sport disappears off commercial television. And we saw it in the UK when they used to have a list like ours and a framework like ours, and they sort of dismantled it. And you had um, the Ashes and the English Cricket Board saying, oh, well, you know, that's OK. Don't worry about that because it'll always be on free television. It's OK. Now, of course, along comes big bucket of money from Sky and the only place you can see the ashes in the UK is on Sky. Uh, and that might be all well and good as a commercial outcome but what has also happened has been that participation rates in that sport have plummeted because half the population doesn't see it. They're not inspired by it. They're not having access to what it means to be part of cricket. Um, so there's bigger issues here at play than who buys what rights. So that's why they 
have an Australian coach and Kiwi captain. <laughs> All goes back to Sky. Um, <laughs> um, Melinda, also Australian content really showcases who we are as a country, as a culture, as a nation. And it's part of our identity overseas, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I'm going to come back to that. I just want to lean in on the regulation comment just, just yeah. briefly. And I think you sort of joked before, and I loved it, that we've got in the audience here people who wouldn't normally come to a CEDA event probably don't know who CEDA is and the words economic development wouldn't cross their minds most days. But I think that it's really important to recognise that, particularly now with a rapid pace of technical uh, technological evolution, that our economy and all the things that we do are being influenced by regulation and the, the nature of that regulation. Um, and it may seem like it's distant from each of you, but it does impact. Um, it's, it's impacting opportunities and it's impacting choices and it's impacting a whole bunch of things. And even if it seems like it's dry and hard to get into, I actually think, I mean, obviously I'm passionate about it, it's what CETA does, but understanding these things and trying to lean into these conversations, thinking about your own engagement with it, the data settings that you choose, the TVs that you buy, these choices are all shaping things and they are all shaped by regulation. So, it may seem sort of dull and boring and whatever else, but the thing that this report is telling you is it's influencing the opportunities that we all have across a number of dimensions. So on the, on the social piece, there's no doubt that, um, that TV and creative, in the creative industry more broadly allows us to see ourselves reflected. It allows important conversations to be had. It allows issues to be tackled in a way that can bring people into them that sometimes are less confrontational and we can evolve things that we need to be tackling in society um, in ways that you can't otherwise do or that are more confrontational. The one thing I'd say, and I'm going to put my National Reconciliation Week hat back on, is I do think we need to see more diversity um, across so much of the content that we see and that's the thing that makes it attractive to everyone when they do see themselves reflected. Whether they're a person of colour, whether they're a person with a disability, whether they're a person of a different religion or race. And the more that we can do that, the more inclusive it becomes and the, more, uh, the stronger the contribution it makes, I think. Yep. Absolutely. All right, let's get into, uh, into the questions that are being sent from the floor. Uh, thank you, everyone, who's done it so far. If you've got a question, go to the app. Um, top of the pops at the moment for the questions. Uh, Bridget, let's start with you on this. What are your expectations for media reform under the Albanese government? Uh, well, um, we had a nice hint from uh, the Albanese government about what they might do just prior to the election. So we're expecting they're going to act very quickly on prominence, which James referred to in his speech. Uh, and we're going to have to look into what is happening with anti-siphoning and make sure that we've got rules that are fit for purpose for the modern viewing environment. So that would be the first two cabs off the rank. And I think we're going to be looking as well at how the... Uh, how we regulate for the, the way we watch TV into the future. Are we going to all be watching over the air? Obviously, we're, we're not. We're all watching in different ways. So what does that mean for the overall framework about how we manage things like spectrum and, and so forth? So I think they're going to be top three. Okay. Uh, James, Paul uh, has a question saying, um, tricky one, will, will your... Uh, where are you? Will your broadcast uh, rivals um, agree and come along for the ride on this total audience package? And what's the temptation that they'll break the rules when something's hot and do the overnight? Uh, look, you know, I mean, the overnights, it's, it's kind of controversial because it's actually our fault. So we've put the overnights out for all these years and then we got to time shift and we never made a big deal, of, deal out of it. Now we've sort of got the BVOD services and we kind of... We kind of try and get that out before the overnights. So the overnights exist in other markets. It's just that the other markets have moved to actually look at three-day and seven-day lenses. So they don't really pay too much attention on overnights. My suggestion to the industry is that we stop the overnights for a period of time. Let's say it's a month. And if we stop it for a month, then everyone will be focusing on the seven-day, three-day, you know, whatever we agree as an industry numbers and sort of getting used to that, you know, cadence. And then once that's there, then we can put the overnights back in. Um, you know, we put out the seven-day numbers and the seven-day numbers actually change the rankings of the program. So you read today what happened last night and who's a winner and who's a loser and all those types of things. And 
seven days later, that all changes. Clients buy on 28 days, so the actual transaction itself is based on 28 days, not seven. So it's just a really, you know, it's a really interesting thing, and we're pretty dumb, really, as an industry, that we haven't addressed that. You know, we've just let numbers get smaller. So you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a huge issue for us. And, on my campaigning hard, and of course they'll agree, Koshi. It's a great. It's actually an industry. <laughs> it's actually good for the industry. So whether you're winning or whether you're losing, if you're reporting a, the correct number, you know, which is changed, it doesn't really matter. And people probably need to take those hats off and stop thinking it's seven trying to do something. Or you know, Bridget has to manage us all, so <laughs> she she understands. Good luck, Bridget. Um, uh, next question from Matt. Uh, not so long ago, a forum like this, uh, we did, uh, there we go, we would never have expected a keynote speech about Australian content that doesn't talk about the public broadcaster or broadcasters. Are they still on the issue agenda? Yep. Well, I mean, I think public broadcasters are an important part of the overall mix. I don't represent them. I've worked for both of them, though. Um, and I do think they do important things. They do things that are different to commercial television. Um, and that's great. And, um, you know, they've got uh, a role to play. So, and they certainly do do Australian content. But I think what's tended to happen is that we think that some of the more highbrow stuff that we get from, uh, you know, ABC and SBS that, you know, fewer people watch is more important than stuff that millions of people watch and that actually is the, the things that are forming people's views about our society and, you know, the shared information that we have. So, um, you know, it's important to have a strong broadcasting sector and we're lucky in Australia that we've got two strong national broadcasters and we've got a very healthy, competitive commercial television sector and we're almost unique um, because even in the UK, they might have a similar number of broadcasters, but they don't have evenly matched commercial broadcasters the way we have here. Um, so that's why we have probably the best quality television industry in the whole world. Yeah, look, I, I mean, I'd agree with Bridget. I mean, we, we do very, very different things, you know, so I think, you know, it's a, it's a different model. You know, it's not necessarily an ad-funded model, even though obviously SBS have a small, you know, sort of commercial side. Where we are butting heads is probably more in the BVOD space. So prices are, you know, getting driven up in terms of, you know, we're actually competing directly, which I think at times is probably against the charter of, um, you know, certainly one of them. But ultimately, uh, it is actually about, you know, sort of the, I suppose you'd call it the broad church of free-to-air um, television, and, and they play an important, an important role. Okay. Um, another question here. The report covers James' scripted content but increasingly free-to-air content is unscripted or strict reality, does this alter the economics involved? I mean, I mean, ultimately it comes back to, you know, those overarching numbers when you look at what we do, you know, as television networks. And so, you know, for any, for any of the big shows, you know, they're anywhere between one and a half to $2 million, you know, per 90-second episode. We know what our news services cost, and what we have to do is we have to make sure that all of our content, uh, you know, sort of resonates with Australian consumers. So, what we're doing is is pivoting to things that work, and you know, reality is what's driving BVOD services. People tend to want to watch their dramas, you know, in a binge style format, where they watch an entire, you know, series will come out and bang, it'll be done in a, you know, sort of few days and weeks. We often get asked about Australian drama, and can we just say, right here, we have the biggest commitment, you know, the highest budget, the best export in the entire country. Um, and we commit to that every single day, to your point, Koshi, Monday to Friday for the 40-odd weeks it's on every single year. Yep. I, I reckon you'd have different, sorry, I reckon yeah. you'd have some different channels too. I mean, if you look at, you look at the voice, like, okay, maybe you're going to have a different sort of cost equation or economic equation if you like, but if you think about some of the dynamic flow on benefits and other parts of this of the industry, um, the music industry, whatever else is going to benefit from that, I think there's just going to be different dynamics to it. Can I just um, say also, I get very frustrated by this sort of oh, drama versus reality kind of dichotomy and people like to, I mean, drama is fantastic and I love it and it's a great way of telling Australian stories, but so are reality programs. Um, 
these programs employ a lot of Australians and they tell the stories of a lot of the Australians that are appearing in those programs and it's like a new way of hearing about ourselves. We, we like to hear about ourselves through drama but we also like to hear about ourselves through these other ways and um, you know we're, we're accessing written content in new forms, we're watching, you know, reading little things on social media and whatever and we're also accessing our own stories in new ways through these kind of programs and we should celebrate them and recognise that they are also high quality productions um, along with our very excellent Australian dramas. And, and more than anything, they do reflect ordinary Australia, don't they? With ordinary Australians doing extraordinary things. Well, and they spark conversations. I mean, a lot of the traffic on social media tends to be generated by the programs that are on free-to-air television. And you will hear people go disparagingly something, I know we're talking seven, but let's take maths because everyone likes to say what a you know, bad show it is and how it highlights bad behaviour. But actually, it provides a forum for discussions between parents and children about what should you expect from a relationship or you know, what did you like about that behaviour or not about that behaviour. Or you watch The Voice and you see the backstory of the person who comes up on stage and you see how hard they've worked to get there and you, you share in their success. I mean, these are the moments that bring people together that actually motivate them. Hmm. Uh, James, another question from the audience. Uh, looking at the wider commercial TV industry, what factors outside of regulation will ensure Australia's TV success in the future? Yeah, I mean, the most important one is, is the audience measurement. So selling ourselves more effectively and actually reporting on the true numbers. So that's absolute priority one. And, you know, if everything goes according to plan, we'll have that rolling out in a different form from calendar year um, 2023. But it's actually also the sophistication of the offering and what we're doing. So if you think about 7 Plus, you know, that is the size of Facebook. You know, at its peak in terms of registered verified users. So overlaying data and having that really sophisticated addressable opportunity for advertisers is something, in, in that brand safety environment, is something you know, that is very, very powerful. And what we're working on at the moment is you know, what we call convergence. And it's how the two work together. So it's an actually additive, how that and the television you know, traditional 30 second spot or sponsorship works together and how that actually achieves a better result. And so if we can be effective for clients in terms of driving results, um, you know, then we'll do very well. I mean, the BVOD market for us, um, we uh, have attracted 1,271 new digital advertisers in 12 months to 7 plus. So that's quite extraordinary. And obviously those markets are growing at, you know, sort of 50, 60, 70%. But that is quite extraordinary. And, and as I spoke about earlier, that market getting to a billion dollars in just a few years. Pretty extraordinary, extraordinary stuff. Absolutely. It, uh, your voting system here at Cedar is fantastic. They jump all over the place as you uh, vote to see which is the, the <laughs> most right. important. Overnight. I lost track of time. I uh, even had a message come up from, uh, from Cedar saying, basically, shut the hell up. Uh, <laughs> it's coming up to 2 o'clock. I was, was going to be sitting here going, yeah. yeah oh, <laughs> all right. I, I was engaged. I was, found it fascinating. Um, ladies and gentlemen, would you... Uh, uh, would you join me in thanking uh, James, Melinda, uh, Bridget and also Jerome for a great session. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>
time the goal. Let's bring home the gold. You've got the power to know. You're indestructible. Always believe it. Cause you are oh. I'm glad that you're about to return. Our record is 87 gold medals at the Commonwealth Games. You're this year, can we break that record? Always believe it. Gold, gold, gold. Let's bring it home, Australia. Get ready for a Commonwealth Games like no other on 7 and 7 Plus.